after a weekend in which all political interviews and political campaigning was cancelled and where radio stations were only allowed to play slow songs and where co-ops could only play bazooki music, the House of Commons has scheduled in seven and a half hours for tributes to Prince Philip. Mr Speaker, it is fitting that on Saturday His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh will be conveyed to his final resting place in a Land Rover which Prince Philip designed himself with a long wheelbase and capacious rear cabin because that vehicle's unique and idiosyncratic silhouette reminds the world that he was above all a practical man who could take something very traditional, whether a machine or indeed a great national institution, and find a way by his own ingenuity to improve it, to adapt it for the 20th and the 21st century. Now, this is a meme I've heard so much over the past four days, which is uh, oh, one of the great things about Prince Philip was he was able to bring the royal family into the 21st century. I mean, on a very literal sense, he did that because he became um, the Duke of Edinburgh in the 50s, and he's still the Duke of Edinburgh in the 21st century. But the only evidence I see for, for doing this in any more material way is he took a video camera to Balmoral. Everyone says, ah, oh, he brought them into the 21st century by making this video in the 1960s of them on holiday. Fine, maybe it was a good video. I don't know if it really um, was a, a shocking feat of, of engineering. Anyway, um, no more complaints about that speech. Let's take a look at what Keir Starmer had to say. Britain will not be the same in his absence. For most of us, there's never been a time when the Duke of Edinburgh was not present. At every stage of our national story, for the last seven decades, he's been there a symbol of the nation we hope to be at our best, a source of stability, a rock. Her Majesty once said, grief is the price we pay for love. The Duke loved this country and Britain loved him in return. That is why we grieve today. I don't know. Is it bad to laugh at that? I just, you know, as I say, as I said, you know, on, on Friday, I went on Sky on Sunday and I said the same thing. It's always sad when someone dies. I'm not here to sort of say, ha ha, I'm glad, you know, it's, it's sad if someone dies and especially if someone has lived with them for over 70 years. But this is ridiculous. So he's, a, he's a symbol of the nation we want to be. This is a man who was born into privilege, who was offensive to ethnic minorities and is the father of an alleged pedo. I mean, is that the nation we want to be? I mean, we can't all be born into privilege. That would then privilege wouldn't exist. That the whole point of status, which is what the royal family is about, is some people have to be below you. We can't all be royal, otherwise royalty wouldn't exist. So, you know, there's a, there's a contradiction there. Um, Keir Starmer also claimed um, in his speech that the monarchy was the one institution for which the faith of the British people has never faltered which suggests he doesn't know his history because he actually made that claim a mere few feet away from a statue of Oliver Cromwell who led the revolution which overthrew the monarchy, including the execution of Charles I. Anyway, truth goes out the window, I think, when it comes to situations like this. Um, one more speech um, I want to show you. This was from Harriet Harman, currently a Labour backbencher. Um, she went down what I thought was a surprising route, although now it seems to be well-trodden. Everyone is, is bringing out this trope this weekend, suggesting that Prince Philip was a feminist. So his decision to give up what would have been a glittering career in the Navy and make his duty to support his wife in her role took him into uncharted territory and left him exposed for if he was not the head of the family, what did that make him? There was no reassuring recognition that he was no less of a man for what he did in putting her first and putting himself second. Of course, Mr Speaker, it takes a remarkable man to be a leader, but it takes an even more remarkable man to support a woman leader. And that's what Prince Philip did. When we hear the Queen speak, we know that she always weighs her words carefully. And what she said at their golden wedding anniversary in 1997 was that Prince Philip had, 
quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. So what a loss it is for her to lose that husband, that partner, her liege man of life and limb. We're rightly paying tribute to his work on the environment, for young people, our armed forces, and much else besides. He did his work, but above all, he enabled the Queen to do hers. And for that, he deserves our recognition and gratitude. He served this country by serving his Queen. <laughs> Ash, I need your take on this. Is the new vision of 21st century feminism that a good feminist man marries a queen? Yes. Like a literal that's queen. that's what you call allyship, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, it's completely fucking embarrassing. It's completely fucking embarrassing that we've got to a state in our national politics where republicanism, which was once a point of view which was happily articulated even in the Commons by Labour MPs who would say, I'm a Republican, is now considered so completely beyond the pale that anybody who wishes to be taken seriously in politics and not assassinated has to say, I pledge my allegiance to this completely outdated way of running a country. And in order to maintain this delusion that this is a good way to run a country, where you've got the belief maintained at the center of power that there is such thing as a superior bloodline and they should inherit power from generation to generation. In order to maintain this fiction, you have this dreadful sight of so supposedly progressive MPs trying to drape the business of feudalism in liberal and forward-looking clothing. Prince Philip is not the first male consort for a British monarch. There was, of course, Prince Albert. Um, this isn't something which is new to us. Uh, William and Mary of Orange, the claim to the throne came from Mary and not William, although there were joint monarchs um, on the throne. Uh, Queen Anne as well. There was a, a male consort, I believe. Um, so this isn't something which is unusual. In, in British history. But what is unusual is having to justify it in modern and even, you know, quasi-democratic terms, because otherwise, if you call it what it is, which is a cartel based on the delusion that they've received some authority from God thousands and thousands of years ago, well, then maybe you would start asking uncomfortable questions. What this is from Labour MPs, I think, is utter cowardice. And that's not to say um, that there's not a loss, an intense feeling of loss um, for the Queen and their children. You know, this is a 73-year marriage. That's not something which you see every day. And imagine that this loss, particularly playing out in such a public way, is deeply painful. But what it also is, this moment of loss, is an opportunity to redraw the boundaries of polite opinion. Because when you start seeing everybody from you know the conservatives all the way through labor being compelled to participate in an act of mandatory mourning well what that does is that shores up the royal's position in in the public eye uh, it's an opportunity to launder uh reputations to manufacture consent and it's quite cynical in lots of ways it's not just a organic outpouring of grief it's cynical. It's also at times quite sinister. And I think no more so than the phenomenon we've seen this weekend where billboards across Britain's cities are converted into being quite crass memorials for for Prince Philip. Um, I want to take you through some of them. We, we showed you, I think, one on Friday, but there have been more that have appeared that I think you just have to see. These are all um, in Birmingham. Um, so you can see there Prince Philip on various shopping centres and car parks and bridges, all very, very dreary British image. Um, the most dystopian one is, is this one. I love this. Let's take a look at um, you're driving down the motorway going into central London. I think that's going under the Blackwall Tunnel. And you can see there these huge images of, of Prince Philip lit up on both sides of the road. And then the next one is probably actually peak. Peak children of men. This is Prince Philip um, turning on the top of the BT Tower. 
<laughs> one of the one of the highest buildings in London. It's a HRH Prince Philip, nineteen twenty one to twenty twenty one, and then his his face um, in in lights. Very very odd. Now the question this raised for me is: How did this happen? Was this was this billboards commandeered? by the state? Did they force the billboard companies to show all of these images of, of Prince Philip? And what would happen to the original advertisers? What if Nike had already paid to advertise on the top of the BT Tower? Now, I, I haven't seen anyone write a definitive article on this, but the person who I think had the most persuasive argument was someone called Jay Owens on, on Twitter, who's a researcher of subway stations. Um, so he, he suggested that Clear Channel, Global, the other firms who own the billboards probably made the decision. And that would probably have been because one, demand is low at the moment for billboards. Not many people are buying stuff. Not many people are, are out and about because most people are in their homes. So there's lots of, you know, the cost of, of, of changing what you're going to advertise isn't huge. But also the biggest customer at the moment for all of these billboard companies is the government with public health ads, et cetera. So this is almost them sucking up to their biggest customer, who is um, the government. So it was a, quite a simple explanation. But Ash, I mean, it all to me looked pretty dystopian. And everything's just so grey, grey Britain, grey motorway. And then you've got like enforced on you mourning for, you know, a, a hereditary royal. But that's the thing is that it is enforced and it is so top down. When Princess Diana died, there was an outpouring of grief. And look, I think that outpouring of grief was outsized, disproportionate. And it's because of the place that royalty and even ex-HRHs like Princess Diana have in our public imagination. But it was bottom up. It was something that people felt compelled to do, leaving the flowers outside Buckingham Palace, uh, you know, the sights of people crying and, you know, really feeling quite wounded by the loss. With Prince Philip, one, there's a very sophisticated media operation, Operation Fourth Bridge, um, which goes into place as soon as, um, you know, the news broke of him dying. There's one for every mem every senior member of the royal family. And then two, what you've got is, I think, an attempt to uh, an attempt to hold at bay an increasingly aggressive and deranged right wing press, where if you fail to display significant, uh, or, or, you know, what they deem a, a suitable amount of grief and mourning, that they will come for you. They will aggressively come for you. Um, I found myself in the Daily Express for having um, made what I think is a true observation, which is that DMX was a better rapper than Prince Philip. And lo and behold, <laughs> I found myself being attacked for it in a right-wing tabloid. It's because there is, I think, um, alongside this desire to impose grief and to, to manage a public act of mourning, which creates buy-in for a deeply unequal society, which has at the top of it the monarchy, you've got almost a sense of bloodthirstiness for those who are seen to step outside of those boundaries. And so that's the really dystopian thing about, um, you know, these billboards or the National Rail turning their, reps, their website into grayscale. Um, it's because they're afraid. They're afraid that if they don't do these things, this performative grieving that they'll be torn apart for it um let's take a look at the gray website first of all if you've ever been on national rail um to, to book a train you'll know that the, the color scheme is i think it's normally red and blue but here it's all all black and white all grayscale and that was um as a a, a memorial i suppose <laughs> to to prince philip um anyway um someone complained about this on twitter or asked why is it all in gray and we're going to show you an interaction um on twitter which was quite striking so first of all in response to that query whoever's running the national rail twitter account says hi the website has been set to gray while we are in the mourning period of prince philip the person replies cheers is there a way to change it back to normal as a user as all gray i struggle with and then the person working for National Rail says, unfortunately, I do not believe there is currently. I will leave a note for someone to look at it on Monday to see if there is, as I too have been struggling to read while it is colored differently. Now, I wouldn't have realized this. Um, if, if, if I worked at National Rail and someone said to me, can we change it all to gray? I would have said, well, it's ridiculous, so probably not. But actually a better argument as, as why you should not do that is because there are many people for whom reading something in low contrast, which is, is grayscale, is very difficult. He's asking, is there any way I as a user can put the colors back so I can read 
So, <laughs> and then the person who literally works with National Rail says, I don't know because I can't read it either, right? This is bananas. What are they doing? What are they doing? Um, and yeah, was, I think today it has changed, which is why that first tweet was deleted because it looks like originally the plan was to have it grayscale throughout the whole morning period, which was eight days. Actually, they've changed it back now because I think, you know, those accessibility issues are pretty, pretty overwhelming. I want to go on to the the public backlash. There is a bit of a backlash there. It's about accessibility issues. There were, when it came to the media, though, many people who do seem to be finding this all fairly ridiculous, or at least rather dull. Um, we talked about on on Friday how the BBC had gone for a simulcast, which meant that they put put out the same show on BBC, BBC Two, and BBC News. Ultimately, that was for 24 hours where you couldn't choose to watch anything else on BBC. BBC Four was just taken off air out of respect. Very, very bizarre. Anyway, um, viewers did not respond particularly well to this. Um, so Jake Kantar is international editor at Showbiz Magazine Deadline, and he crunched the numbers. So he tweeted, the verdict is in. Wall-to-wall -wall TV coverage of Prince Philip's death was a turn-off for Brits, with major channels losing prime time, so at 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. viewers, compared with Friday, April 2nd, so the, the, the previous Friday. Now, the BBC One was down 6%, so 6% less people watched BBC One than they did the week before. ITV was down 60%, 60% less people watched ITV than the week before. BBC Two was down 65%, and Channel Four was down 8.5%. Now, Channel 4 was one of the few channels that didn't devote all of their output to Prince Philip. Some of it was, not all of it. And in fact, the, the show which got the highest ratings on Friday was Gogglebox. So as we talked about on Friday, all of those news stations have been prepping for literally decades for the moment when a royal family member dies. So they can have the perfect output. So everything's in the right place at the right time. You know, they've been planning for literally decades people just want to watch Gogglebox because why, why would you want to watch the same show on every channel, which is a, not a particularly critical or interesting analysis of someone's life, but this absolute fawning, this fawning of this person, which is really, really fake. The second sign of the backlash wasn't just people turning off their TVs. It was them complaining about what was on their TVs. Um, so there was uh, so many complaints to the BBC about all of the channels showing the same thing about Prince Philip and that they set up a dedicated complaints form. So you could type in your, your email address and that would automatically make a complaint um, about the, the overwhelming coverage of the Duke of Edinburgh. Apparently that's standard practice when the volumes of complaints are so large, instead of getting all these different individual emails that they have to catalog, they just put up a form, but um, that wasn't enough to stop it enraging certain conservatives. So conservatives who were enraged by the existence of this form, including the Bow Group, which is Britain's oldest conservative think tank, they argued the form encouraged people to complain who otherwise wouldn't have. And um, this is a tweet from them. The BBC is prompting response in publicizing a complaint form regarding Prince Philip. And they're doing so in a way they don't do with far more controversial coverage that promotes left-wing views or figures. The question has to be asked, why? Um, I think they were annoyed about um, actually, that was on ITV, wasn't it? The Black Lives Matter dance. In any case, there aren't many events when you have the same thing on every channel. I can't think of another one. The BBC ultimately took down the form on Sunday, whether that was responding to um, this pressure from the right or whether it was just that they normally take down forms once complaints have peaked. Maybe we'll never know. The BBC say it was um, the latter. Do you think this has backfired? Do you think in their you know post-game review, they're maybe going to say, maybe we did ram this down too many people's throats and actually this is going to undermine the monarchy instead of reinforcing it. No, because I don't think it does undermine the monarchy. That's the thing. I think people are turned off by it, but not because they're thinking, oh, well, enough of, you know, this old, you know, nonagenarian who none of us care about. That's not what people are thinking. I think what they are thinking is, well, this isn't what I go to television for anymore. The way in which people consume their news has changed a lot since, say, Princess Diana died. So when it comes to a breaking news story, um, if, especially if you're younger, you're probably going to hear it from like a push notification or you read it online or somebody's WhatsApped you. It's not necessarily that you've got the TV on and you're going to be watching it, watching it, watching it, um, and then the news comes on. People are, I think, expecting um, 
news not to take up such an outsized portion of broadcasting time, particularly when you think about um, entertainment only subscription channels that people turn to as well. It means that public service broadcasters, I think, are in a bit of a tricky position in terms of how they fulfill the requirements of their public service remit when consuming habits have changed a lot. So I think that's why people turned off. It wasn't necessarily an expression of their feelings towards the monarchy. I think it was an expression of their feelings towards broadcast media. Now, if I'm uh, you know, the director general of the BBC, and I'm looking at a government which is relying on right wing papers to be uh, you know, anti BBC attack dogs, I will think, well, maybe on balance, it's better for me to be seen to be more in alignment with the government in leading this, you know, enforced and performative grieving than it is to turn off for a temporary amount of time, some of my viewers. 